All right, I think we could probably get started if you want to. It's like we have, so, oh, there's one more person coming in. Um, sound good, everybody? Awesome. Um, let's see, we had we had some questions submitted by four different people. Yep. Um, uh, I, I guess uh, I just it'd be great if most of those people there because I think I would start with Vitali if he's here. I was going to go down. Sure. Um, I I do want to welcome everybody. Um, if you didn't know, uh, this is uh, Eric Rolski who plays with the. Metropolitan Opera Orchestra, and he's done that for what since 2010, I believe. 2010 is when I started. Yeah, and uh, a whole bunch of orchestras teach at Juilliard, uh, Manhattan, and Manus. Did I miss one? I I don't teach at Man Manhattan School anymore. It's just Manus and Juilliard. Uh, okay. Too right. too busy. <laughs> but I enjoyed 20 years of teaching at, at Manhattan School too. Um, and then I guess before the Met, I was at the New York Philharmonic for 17 years. Um, and that was uh, the the biggest part of my career, um, you know, before going to the Met. Um, and if, uh, for those that know me, um, I'm Mike Carrick, I played in the Air Force bands for, uh, since 2001. Um, I know Gregory, who is on this call as well, Plays with a, uh, he had played with presidential orchestra from Ukraine. That's how I met him. And uh, I'd like to thank Gregory for helping us set all this up. So I think, I guess we could just start. I'm, uh, I'm going to play uh, Vitaly's video, I think. All right. Hello, Eric. Such an honor to have the opportunity to have a masterclass from such an amazing musician. My question is, what is the fundamental things which affect in your amazing stability, beautiful sound, intonation, and no cracks? What exercise would you suggest to increase my stability? My second question is how you fight with the stage fright? What is the best way to overcome stage fright? Thank you very much. Uh, let me first say that I'm really honored and uh, really touched to be meeting with you this morning. Um, you know, the fact that you guys are in the middle of a war and we wanna, we're here to talk about music. Uh, is really a strong reminder about why we live and what's important in life. And, um, you know, if war is about destruction, music is about creation. So, you know, I'm happy to, to, to focus on, on the better part of human, human existence. Anyway, um, to uh, answer Vitaly's first question is it's a broad question. And um, Mike, maybe we'll pull up a, a sheet, I, a two-page two thing I wrote called The Fundamentals of Horn Playing. Really, I guess what I want to say, uh, and we'll, we'll go through this quickly, uh, um, feel free to share it, Mike, um, or send it through Gregory for people to have and refer to if they want. Um, but was that the Lawrence book? I'm so sorry. It's called Fundamentals of Horn Playing, and it's a two-page thing I sent last night. Yeah. Um, basically, you know, playing the horn is like anything else that requires, you know, anything physical. It's mus muscle memory is an important thing. And uh, to train your muscles to do to work in the right way is really the secret of doing anything well, whether it's sports, or any other instrument. Um, and, you know, so practice repetition, of course, is a way of, of uh, not that one, but it's called, it's a, it, it's a um, typed out thing. Uh, um, anyway, yeah, any, 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 you know, chance to practice is a chance to program in the correct information in the way in which you use your muscles. 
And so starting from the beginning, the most basic, you know, I think foundation to anybody's horn playing, uh, if you want to be, uh, reach your full potential, uh, a strong foundation is really a, a, a steady flowing air, which is focused here at the lips. Um, and this flow of air at the, which is focused here, uh, I'll get to this later, but was this not can't be focused back here uh, or even maybe three centimeters short of the lips in the middle of your mouth. It has to be focused here. That steady flowing air has to also be independent from any movements of your embouchure or movement of your tongue. That that air is like a, a faucet on a bathtub. You turn the water on and it stays on. So that that is really is, is that there are challenges about keeping that simple job of air flowing to that point. And those uh, those challenges are articulation can disturb the feeling of, of steady air. Um, accuracy, when we get, you know, we're trying too hard to play the right notes on the horn, we sometimes um, art articulate, you know, with our air instead of keeping the air on, and tonguing with our tongue. Um, if, certainly if we get nervous, we've all had that experience where you feel tense and tight and the airflow isn't, is no longer up front here, but it usually falls back towards your throat. So um, uh, anything technically challenging on the horn can also send our basic technique of blowing to this point can send it off the tracks into bad into bad habits. So, you know, I always ask myself when I start to then, I start with very simple things. Um, but remember, if we're just trying to develop a stronger, deeper muscle memory, training the muscles to work in the right way, it's best to start simple um, because harder music will just take our mind off the basic job of what we're trying to do. The questions I always ask myself uh, when I practice is where am I blowing to? Am I blowing? Uh, and, and this is very, you know, seems very uh, simple, but if you, if we all put our finger here and think about blowing only to this place here, of course the air comes out your lips, but you can feel if you blow to this point here, the air is weak. It's sort of spread. It's not strong. If I move now to something in the middle of my mouth inside, not at the front of my mouth, but just in the middle, by putting my finger here and I blow to this point, the air is a little stronger, but it's not necessarily focused until I put my finger here and try to blow seriously to this place here. And if we all do that, you can feel the strength of the air. It's now focused and much stronger. I always have to tell my students that the horn is is a is not an efficient instrument. You know, compared to a trumpet, the trumpet points right at you, trombone points right at you. The horn is going that way, and we have our hand in the bell, and also the. considering how long the instrument is. All of those things make the horn both beautiful for its special sound, but also harder to play, less efficient. So I'm looking for when I start my day for efficiency and I'm gonna check in with all my basic skills. And we'll go through these more, uh, more quickly here. So the question I always ask myself when I start is where am I blowing to here or is it sort of lazy and sort of back here somewhere? Um, I remind myself to bring the air forward. So there's strength and you can hear that just the change of sound. Push back a little bit. You know, if I'm blowing to my throat here. Maybe 
makes a lovely sound, but it's sort of weak. But if I take the same amount of energy, same amount of air from here and move it to this point, it's stronger and it's much more a uh, ringing kind of sound. And it has probably more high frequencies and low frequencies, like the full range of frequencies in the sound. Uh, whereas the, the blowing to my throat creates a sort of very dull, um, dark, maybe even slightly covered kind of sound. So I asked myself, where am I blowing to? Um, is my foc is it focused here, here, or back here? And I want to try to keep it up here. And this is true of 70% of, of everything I play. I have to do it from up here. We'll talk about the exceptions later. Um, do I feel tension in my throat when I play? If I feel that tension in my throat, then my air is probably not quite fully forward in my mouth but further back and that's not not that's not healthy for normal playing everyday playing and then um as i'm playing I, I i also ask myself is my tongue high in my mouth or is it low like if this is the roof of my mouth is my tongue here or is my tongue down here if you think of you're blowing into the horn and your body is a tube do you want to blow through a toilet paper roll or do you want to blow through a straw, a drinking straw? You know, something, you know, do you want to blow something that diameter or are you blowing into something that big, right? So you want to blow with a more focused airstream to get more efficient sound and stability. So in my first notes and I want to make sure again that I'm healthy so I try to get the most efficient playing um, in training my muscles every day um, so when we play with the less efficient sound 30% of the time that's really for softer dynamics and we can use inefficient which is the opposite of efficient inefficient air can help us just to play gentler, softer, because we don't get as much sound with that. But when I'm warming up, I, I start with efficiency. Um, then I quickly, I, I, I'll just walk you through. Um, um, well, maybe I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, I sent in the, um, uh, Facebook Messenger, a copy of a book. Um, it's an English uh, publication. It's called that. Um, and I put a copy in there. This is just a good book for warming up, but, but also for testing this basic skill of air. This is all to be done on the natural horn, no, no vowels. And it, it's, it's also good for teaching. You know, like you can see the first page looks like something you see in the first first day when you play the horn. Um, but I still play that. <laughs> Not every day, but again, if you can do something really simple perfectly, then all you have to do is turn the page and, you know, it gets quite a bit harder. And then you turn one more page and then you're really playing you know, some very much more difficult things, um, but it has to be done the same way, steady air. So um, this is what I do first is this book, because there's no articulation, everything is slurred. Uh, I don't know if they have a copy, um, but um, we can share it later. It's like I said, it's in the Facebook Messenger um, chat. Um, but legato, this is everything is slurred. Legato, there we go. Um, let's just look at the first, um, you know, number one. There we go. I mean, very simple. It's this, probably the first notes you played on the horn. But uh, when I, it was probably during COVID, 
that I started going back to looking at my own playing. And it's very easy to bounce your air and make a legato. So that would sound like this. So you hear it sort of bouncy and the notes slide into pitch. So if I, that, that to me is not healthy technique. That's not turning on the air steady and just letting my embouchure move, my lips adjust the pitch. So when I do that, it's much more smooth and connected. Sorry, <laughs> it's early morning here. Um, I believe that that when we all started the horn, we tended to play every note with separate air. So and we all tend to sometimes if we're not thinking we still do that rather than play through so when i when i play these exercises and mike let's just flip to uh number chapter six each chapter is one page long in this book so it progresses very quickly adding harmonics and range so uh, when I start this one, you know, I am just turning on that air and now we're developing range. And so I'm not, I'm not bouncing my air. I'm just turning on and letting my embouchure adjust up and down the harmonic series. If it, again, I catch myself sometimes oh, looking at the third line, um, second phrase. That one, when you get up high, it's, we start grabbing the notes a little bit and bouncing our air. And I sometimes find myself still. A little bit like that. Instead of blowing through steady air, I'm always looking to connect straight through with steady air. And so um, this book is great for training yourself in the most basic airflow. Um, it's only lips and air. There's no tongue involved and there's no valves involved. Um, but if you want to just give them a look at chapter eight, Mike, and turn the page twice, um, you can see uh, one more. Oh, there we go. Yeah, um, this gets much more difficult. But if you if you look at let's say eight point eight point two there, you know if I can very simple thing. It's steady air. Air is kind of like the bow on a violin. And so, you know, your air, you don't want it to go, duh, duh, duh. You want, duh, um. the, I love the idea of the violin bow being like our airstream because the violin bow we can see, whereas the air we can't see. So if you look at 8.2, I want to play that with the, as steady an air as, as I do the simple things. And that's why, you know, um, I, 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 I usually start in the easy chapters and it just takes 20 minutes playing through to the, the last chapter here, number eight, when I play this every morning. Oh, I'm sorry, it's way too early in the morning. But it's the same feeling of steady air. You get the idea. And that's just steady air. And my embouchure is finding the right pitches. Um, and this is part of, of you know, an answer to Vid Vitaly's you know, question. What do I do to just stay you know, healthy, um, to develop 
you know, the basic skills of horn playing, and it starts with air and embouchure, and they two have to be separate. So as you look at this book, if you concentrate on steady air and let the embouchure independently find all of these notes, I think you're on healthier ground. Um, because the, the most basic problem I think uh, we, all of us as horn players run into is where we're turning our air on and off unconsciously and not just keeping it going. All right, so um, the next thing that I do is just, I'm sorry, this is the long answer to Vitaly's first question, is go through then my the, the other basic skills that anybody needs every day we play the horn which is, can I play with a beautiful legato? This book helps me my legato going. Then comes articulation. Can you articulate well? Can you play high? Can you play low? And can you play loud? And can you play soft? And if you take all those skills, that's 98% of horn playing right there. Articulation, legato, high, low, loud, and soft. If you can do those things, you're in a great place. Um, you know, I'm always working on those basic skills every day. Um, and I, of course, have an, uh, we all how to achieve those goals of great articulation or register range, right? And so this book uh, also, it, once you've played through it, you can see you've covered quite a bit of range. Um, maybe I should start there. Um, hey, uh, um, Eric. Um, I had Claude add that book to the chat. So if anyone wants to download the book, it's in the chat. Great. Okay. Yeah, please do um, share it. Feel free. It's actually um, just so I don't get in trouble <laughs> and, and I'm not um, breaking any copyright laws. What you have is actually just the first half of the book. The second half of the book is the B flat horn uh, harmonic series. Um, of course, all of these can be done on, you know, horn in F, horn in E, horn in E flat, horn in D, you know, you can transpose it, but it's all uh, meant to be on the natural harmonic series. All right, so, um, you know, since this, um, this book that we've been talking about and um, also covers range, um, I, uh, let's just talk, start off by talking about that. And, and some people uh, in the chat yesterday, the day before, we're asking questions also about range. Uh, really, first of all, the difference between a high note and a low note is a high note requires fast, fast air. Not a great deal of quantity because we're, we're blowing through a small hole here. Low notes are the opposite. We need a, a lot of air. And it's also air that is less focused. It's, it's a bigger diameter. All right, so that's the first primary difference. So when I, going back to like the warm up I was just doing, as I go higher, yes, my lips are shrinking the size of the hull. And if you have, imagine a garden hose and we turn the water on to water the plants. And if you have nothing on the end of the hose and you have the water all the way on, a lot of water comes out, but it lands, it goes and lands on your feet. But if I put my finger on that hose without changing the faucet, that water we know squirts far. Um, so that's the same idea here. If we just close, shrink the size of the hull with your lips, um, then of course the air moves faster and it sends us up into the high register. So, and the opposite, when we go down, when I go down my, the word wool, um, in English, W-O-E, wool. Um, but when I say wool, if I turn this way, you can see my jaw, my chin, my whole jaw uh, goes down, but also forward, sort of at a 40, 45 degree angles when I say, whoa, whoa. And what this does, I'll put the mouthpiece there, 
um, is it pushes my teeth, my lower teeth, against more against the rim of the mouthpiece. <laughs> and that lowering of the jaw um, helps me to get into the low register. So hmm, maybe I should turn sideways here. You can see, but. <laughs> Right, so that's what I think of as I go through that book, as I'm going up and down. It's just reminding my muscles about the movement of the jaw up and down as I go up and down the series. So that sort of takes care of, of range. Um, I'm sure that there's a lot more specific information we can get to, but I think about the speed of my air and the movement of the jaw. Uh, next thing. Legato, we've talked about. So there's high, low, and legato. Articulation would be the next thing. Um, I consider, you know, again, when I'm getting ready for the day, this is just another skill that I have to, it's like taking my pencil and sharpening it for the day, put it in the pencil sharpener, and it, it works better. Articulation. Um, Mike, maybe you want to. Well, pull up that uh, drawing of the inside of your mouth. Um, I, I think of articulation like a range, just like a dynamic range. Uh, you know, we have fortissimo and then we have pianissimo on the other side of things. Um, but uh, when it comes to articulation, I think about the most pointed articulation and the most smooth tenuto as a range and I try to play everything in between. So um, this diagram is really about one end of the articulation range. And this is I call T, just like the letter T. Um, I call this T articulation. Um, and this is something that the horn doesn't do at this. Um, I always think of the end of Tchaikovsky's Fifth Symphony um, and the trumpets come in first with a fanfare and they go dun, ta, da, ta, 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 and the horn section usually sounds like because we don't have the same pointed articulation. Um, part of that reason is of course we, we point backwards and, and instead of forwards. And so when you hear it bouncing off the wall and the ceiling, it doesn't tend to sound so clear. So I think that this end of the articulation range is something everyone should work at. So let's just look at the diagram for a second. And if uh, it's pretty obvious, this is the, uh, looking you know, at your mouth. Uh, and if you, uh, Mike, maybe you could just scroll with the arrow, point to the back of the top tooth. And just let's all follow the arrow with our tongue. Go up and down the back of the tooth. And then you have that flat shelf of gum behind the top tooth. Uh, maybe not that far back, just there, yeah, that line right there. So if we put the tip of our tongue against the middle of that tooth, you'll find that the top of your tongue touches that um, flat gum area and if you try to blow the air doesn't come out your tongue is acting like uh, maybe a cork in a champagne bottle so if we take a breath and we try to blow with our tongue in that position nothing comes out but all we have to do is move the tongue from the solid line um, you can show them the solid line that says set and we move it a millimeter to the dotted line and that releases the air. So this is where I, I always talk about blowing to the front of your mouth or to your lips. So if I take a breath and I'm going to tongue, I'm gonna to put my tongue in this position with the air 
right at where uh, it, it touches, the tongue is touching that soft gum right behind the top teeth. And I get that explosive, like again, a cork coming out of a champagne bottle kind of sound. You don't need the horn to practice this, just get comfortable with that mechanics. Again, you're training muscles. So we can all just practice for a second, take a breath, set the air and the tongue and release an explosion, a real burst of air. And on the horn, that, that will sound very much like a trumpet, very clear articulation. Tongue play. So in tempo, one, two. And you hear the, I'm not trying to play loud, but the air is so strong without any effort. And again, I come back to the idea that we want to develop efficiency in our playing. That takes no work at all. And anybody who's got their horn in front of them, try it. If not, you can do it without the horn of just, I'll just count off and I'll say one, two, and we'll breathe on the third beat. We'll set the air and the tongue together and then just pull the tongue out of the way. So it's not really an attack, it's more of a release. When I was young, I thought, you know, playing a note was like throwing a punch with my tongue. But in, in fact, it's the opposite. It's just having the air there and pulling the tongue out of the way. So I'll just we'll practice this without the horn here. One, two, breathe, set. You get that kind of pop. Um, another another way of, of sometimes teaching this, I learned this online, is <laughs> just taking the mouthpiece. And if I put my finger over the end of it and blow, pull my finger out of the way and you get that sort of kind of pop to the articulation. No, that's no tongue. That's me just blowing and using my finger like my tongue. All right, so now I do that with my tongue. And my tongue just moves uh, from the dotted line to the solid line back and forth. It's like a little bit like a valve or a piston. And consistent with what I said before, the very first thing about horn playing being air is on, stays on, whether you're slurring or tonguing. So my tongue is going to go one, two, one, two, one, two, one, two through this airstream and slice it with a sharp knife here, if I'm doing uh, the right position. Every note is the same volume, every note has the same attack because my tongue does the same thing and the air has not changed, okay? So that's consistency of articulation and, and, the, the mo and probably the most difficult articulation, which is very pointed, okay? So, And my suggestion is when you try this and try to practice this is to just single note, do, 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 or pick another note. Keeping the air always forward, focused here and just on. Do not articulate with your air or with your throat ever. It's a bad habit, all right? Now I said articulation is a range. So um, the strongest articulation is T. Then I move on to D, 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 D is more rounded. So I might just play an exercise that I go from D, T to D. So I started very pointed and I moved into rounded attacks, tenuto. And then I might move even to something softer. I think T is the strongest, D, D, D is moving towards tenuto. And then like the English word, the, T, H, E, or T, H, E, E, I think the, 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 the. Now my tongue is really just like brushing 
inside my mouth. It's the same as speech. T versus D, D, D versus V, V, V. Every time we change the um, consonant, T, D, V, our tongue changes in our mouth. And it, it, what we do in speech really works on the horn. So um, I'll go T, D, V. And then D. And then V. I've known people to also helps me sometimes to think Lee, 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 like the letter L. Very smooth, very gentle. And then even maybe Z, 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 which is like pulling your tongue slowly backwards. And these get us, you know, variety of, of articulations. And again, you can think of it as a violin bow of, you know, from the most short attack to something almost that sounds slurred or connected. All right, um, so we've talked about legato, we've talked about articulation, we talked about uh, high and low playing. Um, loud and soft playing, you know, it really is pre it's pretty obvious, but it's something, you know, one should visit on in the beginning of their day. I don't, you know, I, I know this takes a longer time to explain and I appreciate you're all hanging in there paying attention. Uh, Uh, I, I get through my, my practice session and in short as 20 minutes, if I have a lot more free time, I might spend 45 minutes just going through it more slowly, a little more carefully. So, but if you take care of those six skills, air first, but then moving on to specifically legato, articulation, high, low, loud, and soft playing, you really are set up well for the day and, and reminding yourself about the correct way of doing this, okay? Uh, so that's the, uh, the very long answer to the very first question, which was kind of broad. Um, I'd like to, to just uh, answer, so I think it was someone named, um, I didn't catch his name. Um, I think it was Alev um, who had a question about first notes. And the first note on the horn, it's very common uh, amongst horn players, students. I had a problem myself more than once of anxiety about missing the first note gets us tied up with too much tension in our bodies. And, and, and we suddenly we don't have the ability to come in, ta, but usually da, you know, and locked feeling of being locked up. All right, so it's a, it's a great question because it's such a common problem. The first thing I would say is try to calm down and allow yourself to miss the first note. Of course, do that in the practice room and hopefully not in the concert. But what you, what you wanna practice is, again, it's muscle memory, the whole timing of breathing and playing. So. The biggest thing that helped me first was to, to make sure I had a tempo going before I thought about even practicing the first note. And then you know, I decided I would count off four beats. One, two, three, four, and make sure that whatever came out, it was going to be on time, even if I missed it. But what you find too is you have to then figure out how many beats before you play are you going to breathe? And depending on the tempo, um, you know, probably one beat is enough. So one, two, three, boom, boom. And it's just like, a, you know, kicking a soccer ball or swinging a golf club. There's a timing to it. Uh, so boom. Boom. So I would say um, use your metronome and um, relax. That's the thing. But, all, but also the tension usually when we lock up is in the back of our throat. Air up here 
And it's a very small movement of the tongue as um, Mike showed in that diagram I wrote, uh, which you can put in the chat too. Any of the th stuff I sent, Mike, you can put it in the chat and I hope people will download and maybe it'll make more sense when you're looking at it later um, or now. Um, but that small movement of the tongue is all we need to release the note. So one, two, three. And, you know, just keep it easy and relaxed. Any note. One, two, three. And I think that's, you know, loosening it up and, and, and not um, putting uh, too much importance on, am I hitting the right note or not? Just get, feel the easy inhale and release of the, and the tiny movement of the tongue pulling out of the way where it's blocking the air and you're releasing it. Um, so, um, you know, fear is, is, is really the root of this problem. And uh, so to overcome your fear, you know, you just have to uh, allow yourself to make mistakes and then just practice the mechanics of it. So your whole body is in motion, boom. Um, I always think of it as an, an appointment that I have to keep, okay? And don't allow yourself in the practice room to be uh, a little late, okay? It always has to be boom. Um, let's see, another question that came up. Um, Do you want me to play any of the other videos, Eric? Oh, sure, that would be great. Why don't we... Um, Let's go to Alev who asked that question about first note sphere because his second question, uh, second and third questions were, were I thought really particularly uh, interesting. Uh, sounds not on. Hello, Eric. My name is Alev. I'm very glad to have an opportunity to receive useful advices from such a professional French horn player. My first question is about first note. I have a problem with attack on first note. I think I stop my exhalation when I want to take it with my tongue. I mostly have this problem after high D. What can I do to resolve this problem? My second question is how important is it to exercise regularly in the same time every day? My third question, what the right way to connect notes together into phrases? My next question will be about endurance and high register. How to improve it? What kind of exercises will help the most? Long tones in all register or harmonic series? And the last one. I'm using the David Cooper's warm ups and some other exercises for my flexibility from book Home Fundamentals. Could you recommend me something else from your experience? Thank you for your help and for your answer in advance. Have a good day. So, um, yeah, working backwards, um, talked about David Cooper's exercises. That's kind of funny because David Cooper, as you know, you know, he played. An American horn player who played uh, principal in the Berlin Philharmonic for only one season, and then he won the Chicago Symphony job back home, where he is currently principal horn. But I'm in Dallas right now as guest principal horn with the Dallas Symphony, um, because this was David's job before he left, and they never filled the position. So they're recording Brahms four this week, and I'm invited to to come, and I had an easy week to take off from the opera. So here I am in sitting in David's chair. David is also a, a, a student I had at a summer program when he was just going into college. So uh, I've known him for a long time. Um, so he talked uh, in the last two questions about flexibility. Um, I, I do think you'll find that this book, you know, it's a great start because if you, you, you know, again, if you're looking to increase flexibility, um, you know, if you can play, you know, looking at the more difficult ones, if you can play something like that without vowels, 
I think you've got some good flexibility. Um, this book covers, you know, range. And I, I love the, uh, the, you know, the, if you can be accurate and hit all the right pitches without vowels, then the rest of your day when you edit the vowels becomes a lot easier too. But it's a good one for flexibility. Um, I, I've also included some articulation exercises um, that um, Mike will post. Um, and I think it's called articulation and centering. And I, I do it uh, are both tongued and slurred and they they're, they start slow, but then it gets into a lot of agility and it covers a lot of range. The more interesting uh, question though that that uh, Olaf asked, uh, we already talked about first notes um, um, question for um, issue that he was having, but uh, two questions, one about practicing uh, same time every day. Um, well, I don't practice every day. I mean, uh, um, you know, do I play so much that a day off is, is maybe a healthy thing? I, even, I try to get one day rest every week uh, where I don't play at all. But what uh, everyone's different. Some people feel the need to play every day. I think at the, the minimum, though, uh, is, is to do these practice your skills. Um, I know it's not as much fun as playing beautiful music, but um, 20, 20 minutes, 30 minutes, is just to remind the muscles to 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 um, to work in the proper efficient way. And so remind yourself: How do you do? Uh, where does the mouthpiece go on your face? How do I blow into the horn? How do I articulate? Play high, low, loud, soft. All those things, legato. Uh, that's an important thing. And I think most professionals, if you ask them, um, probably spend eighty percent of their time playing their instrument away from the job. 80% of the time, just working on their basic skills, exercises, uh, maybe etudes. Um, these, these. I, I hate the word warm up because it seems like it's just to get the muscles loose, but in fact, it should be comprehensive, and and you should cover all the basic challenges that you need every day, the basic uh, techniques of playing the horn, and there are not that many. So, that's the most important thing, I think. Um, I think professionals too, because we're busy and we have to think about endurance. If you've got rehearsal on a concert in a day, how much practice are you going to do, you know, um, on the horn anyway. So professionals with limited time and you want to <laughs> enjoy, uh, time outside of music too, uh, we have to be very efficient in how we use our time. So, you know, don't practice things you already know. I mean, after you do your practice about your basic skills and you reminded them now you have a piece of music on the stand you're learning I will go right to the places that give me trouble and not worry about the stuff that I know in this in this concerto that I that I don't that I don't have trouble with so um, being more like a surgical about uh, where you start your practice and where do you put the time in and then it, practicing is problem solving so you know uh, don't just play it and play it and play it and play it. Yeah, it eventually will get better, but maybe it's better to just play it once and analyze, okay, what is the problem here? Why is this passage giving me trouble? And analyze it in, and, and I always say, start from where you can succeed. So uh, this also gets to a, a bit of a, a question that Gregory had. Uh, so let's say it's a technical passage, uh, 16th notes. And uh, for Gregory, it was Mozart concerto number one and D horn. It's awkward fingerings in that key. Do you um, want me to play the video quick. Um, yeah, we'll get to that in a second. Um, I mean, I'll let me just throw out the idea and then we'll go to Gregory. Um, but. Um, <laughs> you know, there's a lot of fingerings there that you know the third third finger is so weak compared to the first two and and depending on the speed you're going on it's uh hard to sometimes get them to coordinate and all that so um what i will do is i'll put on a metronome uh, here it is and um i always say you know if you have a technical passage like that Start from where you can succeed. Um, it's not a bad speed, roughly. All right. Um, 
when I was a student, you know, my teacher would say, we'll put the milch on really slow and then play it and then move it up a little faster and faster and faster, um, which works, but it takes a long time. And, and I didn't, don't always find that as effective um, um, as trying an, another way that I learned later, which is to learn it one note at a time. And that's why I say, start from where you can succeed. If I just keep playing that passage over and over again, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's not. Um, and the, the problem may still be in there. And I, I want to be able to count on playing this passage right every time. One, so two, I'll three, put the metronome four. on and I'll do the first two notes. <laughs> And so imagine this is my first day learning this piece. I can learn it at performance speed, but I'm just going to add a two, note at a time. Three, four. See, that last one was good. The third note, it involves that third finger. It wasn't really coordinated well and I didn't articulate that third note really well until that last time so now I keep practicing three notes <laughs> add a fourth note <laughs> sorry that's five notes but you get the idea and you can what happens is is you're seeing it from the first day you're seeing these notes at full speed but if you do it one note at a time you start to it starts to get used to that speed and instead of it being like a blur and maybe everything's not things coordinated you've trained from note one to note two and note two to note you no know, it's only two two beats of 16th notes or something like that um you now know how to how how you can you know you spend enough time going from one note to the next that it becomes very clear and the coordination is much more solid and you have the satisfaction of course of 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 playing it um from the first day at full speed uh the other thing i, I find is that at full speed you know we're using different muscles really than when we go dee da 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 dum doesn't feel like it relates to the performance that you eventually will have. So first day, but up, bit at um, bit at um, bit at um, bit at um, bum, but um, bit at um, bum, but um, bit at um, bum, but um, you get the idea. So, I mean, that's that's I think a, a good way of learning technical passages. Um, and and nobody likes to go to the practice room and feel defeated, you know, to feel like. <laughs> I'm not, this is not coming. So I always say start from where you can succeed. And that applies to any situation. Find a way of simplifying it. Um, you know, I, I sometimes have students working on the uh, Wagner Siegfried call and they have trouble. And so I say, well, let's break it down because what is the issue here is blowing dum bum. Da -dum, they usually stop their air right there. So I have them do it on one note. And just blowing the straight line, tonguing through that block of air. And if they can do it on one note, then they have a better chance. Right. So always start from where you can succeed and simplify things, figure out what is the technical issue and work on that. And then you can add the notes or whatever the next level of difficulty is or the next challenge. OK. Um, all right. Well, that I think. And oh, and the, the, the other part of Ola's question that I thought was very interesting. Mike, do you have a Tchaikovsky fifth um, little diagram that I, I i sent you i think too we can post that uh this is really the most interesting part of making you know music for me i'm sorry all this has been so technical but um you know i i i, I do believe that if you change how you play something then everything 
you ever play will improve. You know, if, I, if we work on articulation and improve that, every piece you'll ever play will sound better, right? So that's why it's so important to work on these basic It's to coach people on Mozart concerti or Strauss concerti or orchestra passages. That's always really, you know, interesting. It's about making music. But, you know, the, you have to accumulate skills in order to play your best music so that what you feel in your heart comes directly out to the audience. And that's what this is about. So um, uh, when I was a student, I'll tell you a little story real quick, um, you know, I had, you know, naturally good high register and I, you know, and good sound, uh, probably better than most of the kids my age, and so you know I would play something that was you know loud and high and and you know I, if I didn't miss any notes I felt very proud and then you wait for the comments to come back from t teachers and they would always say you really need to subdivide <laughs> I was like I thought any any you know it's about rhythm and I, I thought any idiot can do that but who can play these high notes that i just played you know i'm thinking i'm very proud of myself and um and then one day i'm you know later much later <laughs> I, I think i was already finished with school and beginning professional life when someone made the connection for me that um it's not just about good rhythm to play in in an ensemble better but rhythm as a, and subdividing you know within the beat so instead of one two three we think one and two and three and four and that the uh, the idea that um, subdividing was actually to play better music to be more expressive and more convincing in your phrasing all right so um I'm sure everybody knows the famous horn solo from Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony. Um, and what this diagram here is, well, um, is you don't think of Tchaikovsky Fifth Symphony as a rhythmic <laughs> solo because it's so free and expressive, but it has to start somewhere. And, you know, the thing is, is I, everybody has, you know, feelings about this, um, but, I found it frustrating that I would feel emotional about a piece, a solo like this behind the horn, but the people on the other side listening didn't really quite hear the message. And I realized that what was coming out the bell didn't really accurately represent my feelings. So this is where you sort of look at a solo like this under a magnifying glass. You have to look at, we have a lot of long notes. La, da, da, di. Da, da, di, da. And I think most people do not think about the life inside the long notes. We don't think about that enough. And what happens is, is you lose your audience already when you go to sleep and go on vacation in the long notes. Da 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 da. You see, it already sounds choppy. It sounds like every, it, that the phrase ends with every long note, but it's a long phrase. So uh, to avoid that and to really lead my audience exactly on the journey that I hear, I think about this in a subdivided fashion. And I, and it looks very mathematical here, but on the chart above the music, I, every dot is an eighth note and it's either moving towards greater tension, you know, increasing the volume or relaxing the volume and relaxing the emotions. And, 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 and leading the audience to where I actually think the peak of the phrase is. And, you know, great music deserves this kind of attention. Just, you know, painters, great painters spent years on one painting, you know, getting it just perfect. And I think that's what we, we owe this to our, our art here. So um, I'll play it in the subdivided fashion. And I'm, I'm basically 
every, I, I think about, you know, having my uh, hand on a volume dial, like on your radio. And with every eighth note, you notice there's no two that sit at the same volume level. Because I believe music should never stay stagnant. It should be flowing. So it's either moving towards more excitement, more tension, or more relaxation and more resolution. So uh, you can do this to any solo, by the way. I just, this is a good one just because there's so many long notes in it. Um, I hear so many students play it nicely, but very choppy. Um, and this always sets them on the right path. So. <laughs> So you get the idea of that. I'm just really playing um, again what's on that graph. I'll do it again, you know, just to give you the idea of here two eighth notes uh, the same. They're always moving up or down from the previous note. So um, and the long G sharp, that's a long note. You see, you notice I have it diminuendo at first, and then crescendoing into the next sequence. So it, it doesn't stay flat. I'm just training my air to follow that plan. And then I would go back to Tchaikovsky's rhythms and hopefully you're never again hearing any moment that's sitting neutral, but it's moving maybe slowly, gradually this way or that way. Notice that the downbeat of measure one is marked 3.5 in volume, where the next downbeat is five. And the ultimate climax is, well, it's early in the solo. It's a long solo, but it's only peaks at a six. So anyway. Sorry, I'm subdividing still. I didn't mean to. for 10 o'clock in the morning here. Sorry, not even 9.30. <laughs> that, that's uh, my best for now. But you get the idea about how important it is to m have your hands on the steering wheel at every moment. And be, you know, even if you're sitting on a long note and steering that this way and that. Um, you know, the importance of subdivision, and this starts touching on some of the other questions. Um, but when you subdivide like that, um, and it doesn't have to be metronomic, but, you know, it, it can be expressive like the Tchaikovsky if it has rubato, but you're in control of the rubato on a much mm, more uh, involved and, and detailed way, you know. Da, 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 da. Something like that. Big beats, sometimes it seems like we're Da, 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 that seems random, but more organically. Da, 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 da. When you speed up and slow down, you have that kind of control when you subdivide. But what I was going to say is that when you practice this way, and you and you go back to playing it with the note values that Tchaikovsky wrote, 
I think you'll find you're more involved at every moment about where is the phrase going and you're more deeply involved in focused in making music and feeling it every moment and what comes out is closer to what your ideal and what you need your heart tells you this how this should be sung and um it's a very simple tool and anybody can do it but you have to be willing to you know like sculpt like a, an artist you know you have first the block of marble and you chip away and you sort of rough out the shape and then you have to get in there and you have to fine tune it with maybe some sandpaper to make it really smooth and that's that's i feel feel like this is a way of sculpting and sound um and it uh my students uh, have said you know they're really five basic reasons they've discovered you know why this helps first of all it helps the rhythm <laughs> you know of course you're playing in time uh secondly uh it helps their airflow because we tend to sort of get lazy on the long notes and we sort of take our foot off the gas pedal of the airflow when you go da 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 <laughs> it's but when you're working every part of that note the air continues to work and it continues to flow and you continue to have control over that so that's number two, airflow. Three, accuracy. They end up being more accurate players because they're not turning their air, our air on and off, but they're keeping the air going. So one note sort of melts into the other one. And um, uh, so that helps them to be more technically uh, proficient and coordination. You know, uh, if you know where the next note's going to come, your fingers, your embouchure, your air move together. But if you're not subdividing, you know, that's where accidents will happen. So it's, and the fourth reason that they find is exactly what we just talked about. They feel more musical. Um, that what comes out the bell is more true to their uh, ideal um, version of a phrase. And the fifth thing is psychological now. And there were a lot of good questions about the psychology and the and nerves and performance anxiety um i'm sure all of you had this moment maybe if not in sports you've certainly maybe have this experience um in music uh or some other, some other activity maybe it's even reading a book where you feel so absorbed in what you're doing at this moment um a good book can do that, um, where time stands still. And, you know, when you, when you pick your head up and realize, wow, an hour went by and it was felt like five minutes. Um, that's a wonderful thing. And we, in, in English, we say as being in the zone, sports uh, athletes talk about getting in the zone um, because it's a performance too. And um, their focus has to be so intent on the job they have to do. So I feel that for the musician, for the horn player especially, subdividing and, and, and knowing exactly where every part of every note is going, musically, expressively, connecting to your own heart, puts you so much more deeply into this moment now. This being in the zone really is living in the present tense. And the present tense is gone already. That was the present tense. It's already history. So I think as horn players, we get on stage and it's such a hard instrument. Um, the fear, the anxiety comes from either the future or the past. Like you can start a concert and think it didn't go well in the rehearsals. And so the past is making you feel uncomfortable in the present now you may feel not scared of the past but you might feel afraid of the future of like what happens if i don't play this well what happens if i miss this passage or the, here comes the high note and we start getting very nervous and you're not living in this moment and I think that this is what the subdivision thing can do. It's almost like saying to yourself, now, 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 now,
instead of thinking, you know, the end of the solo is still a minute left away. Don't be worried about that moment. Only here, and it's one step at a time. You know, it's one one foot in front of the next, and you'll get up the mountain. You will. Don't worry about it. But I think that's an important part of. You know, it's like um, good medicine for the brain and 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 anxiety. All right. Um, I think it was uh, uh, Julia who also. And Julia talked about stage fright. Um, maybe do you want to run uh, Julia's video? And, and please, I welcome anybody's questions. Um, I, there's some activity in the chat. I haven't been checking that. So if any questions come up. If somebody, has, if somebody has a question, please uh, either type it or uh, speak up. Uh, we have a lot of me here to help translate. Yeah, I'm, I've been talking nonstop, but I had a lot of coffee this morning. <laughs> So you you want to run Julia's um, questions for us? Yeah, I'm about to share, uh, screen share that. Hi, Eric. I have several questions. The first, have to work on intonation. Have to improve your intonation. How important uh, is uh, practicing voice exercises and singing? The second. How to deal with stage excitement and stage fright? What should you pay attention to when you feel stressed during a performance? How to deal with negative thoughts? What paths should I take to properly react to stress during stage excitement? Thank you very much. <laughs> Yeah, so in addition to subdivision, when it comes to stage fright, because it's something we all, everyone gets scared. Uh, anybody who says, any any musician on any instrument who says they don't get scared, they're probably lying. You know, at some point we do. There are times when when I feel less, you know, uh, anxiety when I perform. Um, and then there's some pieces, some situations, or just some days, because I'm not the same person every day. We all feel slightly different from day to day. Um, where I feel more anxiety. And um, I would just say to you, um, uh, don't expect not to get nervous, expect that you will. But someone told, shared with me a, a, an interesting thought recently, which is that, you know, when you, of course, when we get nervous, our body changes, we get tight, our muscles tense up. Maybe you get a dry mouth, maybe you get sweaty hands your heart rate beats faster and you, you, you don't breathe as, as deeply, right? So, um, but someone pointed out that those physical symptoms um, are really almost the same as when you get excited. So this being nervous and this being excited, well, excitement gets your heart up, your body tenses up when you get very excited about something. So if mentally in your head, you can sort of, Instead of telling yourself you're getting nervous, exciting thing to play this piece, this concert. And, and so, you know, instead of feeling nervous, you can sort of turn it into something positive about, I'm really looking forward to it. It's a little bit like getting on the roller coaster <laughs> at the carnival. Um, you, you know, you're, you know you're, you're not going to get hurt going on the roller coaster. It's just going to be an exciting thing. And it's, you're a little nervous about it but you look forward to it. And when you've finished it, you want to go back on and go around again, right? And it, that's kind of like playing concerts. I had a teacher once who said, I hate playing, but I love having played already. You know, that's a great feeling. And it makes you want to come back, you know, just like the roller coaster ride. Um, so in any case, I, I would say to you, um, you know, uh, the other thing that always pulls me through when I feel really nervous is to remind yourself how beautiful the music is that you're playing. And, you know, that's the whole reason why we got into this, right? It's our love of music. And I know that sounds very corny, <laughs> um, um, maybe cliche, but 
it, you know, maybe before concert, I have to listen to, you know, the piece or just even in my head, just sing my favorite parts and, and remind myself how beautiful this piece is. Um, and, and, and then when I'm there on stage of uh, being here and not worried about the future, you know, just enjoy, I, you know, listen, sit on stage and you listen to what's going on around you. I think when we get nervous, our, our, our vision shrinks from instead of the big picture, like you're out in the audience hearing the whole thing, it becomes so, it's like a magnifying glass turned or telescope when we turn it back at ourselves and we, and we, and we don't hear the people around us playing. It's like you, you're very critical about every note that's coming out of your own instrument. And instead, listen, try to expand your view when you're, when you're performing and, and hear as many of the other voices around you and feel part of that. And then it takes the attention off of yourself and it takes away the negative critical um, uh, view that you have of yourself, which makes you only more nervous, right? Um, I, I also, once I expand my view, I remember that this moment is not about me. It's about Brahms <laughs> or Beethoven or whoever it is that, that I'm playing right now. So, um, and that's really, we, we're here to serve the music that came from these great masters. And where does that music come from? Who knows? It's, it seems divine that, that such beauty moves through. It's not really about me, right? So I, I don't attach. I don't put too much attachments. And that's also, yeah, my, my wife, she's from Taiwan. She's Buddhist. And I subscribe to a lot of Buddhist ideas, philosophy, and not attaching to, to things because attachments um you can attach to the future it's an expectation it's going to go well or it has to go well or you might attach a negative it's like oh i'm afraid this is not going to go well it's all it's in the future it's like attachments uh, take you away from this moment here and attachments are again you're attaching to the past mm, something didn't go well or in the past you're carrying it forward you know, or you're attaching to the future, an expectation that if it doesn't go well, I won't get this job, or I, um, my colleagues won't like me, uh, or I'll get fired, you know, it, it's, that's another form of attachment. So um, that's um, certainly something to, to think about that puts your mind at ease. Um, you know, I, I, I sometimes can talk myself down to you know, remind myself, like, what is the worst day I've had in the last month? Probably wasn't that bad, you know? And what's going to happen in this concert? Probably the average of what I've done this last month. You know, and if you can live with your average and you've been doing good work, um, that's all you, that's about the only thing I would ever expect. And then, you know, you let go about suddenly playing like Dennis Brain or Barry Tuckwell. Or, Herman Bauman or whoever, you know, I'm not, I'm not them. I never will be, you know, it's like, I'm just going to be the best Eric that I can be. And I find that comforting. And it sort of allows me then to, you know, to succeed and fail as, as I will, you know, and, and not to expect or attach to something that I'm not. Um, uh, Julie asked a question about singing too. And I think singing is so important for, for intonation. I don't know if, her, if she was talking about singing uh, to help with intonation, but you know, again, if you can sing it, you can play it. And if you can sing it in tune, then you're very sensitive about pitch and, and you'll hopefully behind the horn be just, you, you have that voice in your head that you've established of how beautifully and, and beautifully in tune something is. So singing is great. Also, it puts you in touch with phrasing. You know, so singing is something we do so naturally. I'm not a trained singer, but when I sing like the Tchaikovsky earlier, you know, it comes out really just the way I hear it um, because I don't have any expectations of singing beautifully. When I pick up the horn, I'm thinking about now as a 
it's got to be perfect this sound this articulation all those other things but when i sing it i don't have any expectations about how great i sing so I, da 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 gee da 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 gee it just comes out that way so i think singing is a great thing um one other fine point about in, intonation um, I think it's important to understand, um, as, as, as at least as I do, and I'm sorry, I'm going to low tech this, I'll just draw something really quickly. Um, I think every note on the horn is a little bit, it's, it's certainly it's a target. Um, and so, you know, there's the target. Well, anything, this is a one note. If you play anywhere inside the circle, you will get the right note, but it's the center of this note that gives you, we call it the core, the center of the sound. So when we talk about centering a note, that's the first step towards intonation. Um, it's it's um, finding that place in the note where the sound is most clear. If I, um, Again, sorry, I'm just drawing. Okay, so if I blow into this note with big, unfocused air, you know, this will hit the target, but it'll hit the entire target. And it's sort of spread energy, and it won't give me the clear sound. This, um, I think of it as a donut. <laughs> the cake part of the donut is the warmth, the rich, fluffy sound of the horn, but the whole is the clear part of the note. And I think, uh, so, you know, if you cover, if the energy is all out here, you never get the clarity to the sound. I think that you know much better is to blow with an airstream. Sorry, I'm drawing again. That um, is more focused. Something like this. I don't know if you can see that the smaller arrow, because that smaller arrow will probably land on the target like this where we're getting a combination of a lot of energy going into the center of the note and some energy into the warm, again, um, rich, velvety kind of sound of the horn. So some horn players sound very bright and very clear, and some sound very sort of covered and dark. And everybody has their own recipe. Is how much, how much of this donut <laughs> are we gonna cover? You know, you could you could draw rings around the center, um, and everyone has a recipe. How much of this cake part of the donut are you gonna have in your sound, and how much energy is going directly into the center? So this, uh, the best way to demonstrate this is, is again, I think earlier, the very beginning, sorry, like an hour and a half ago, I was talking about <laughs> blowing into the horn with hot air and from here, like you're trying to fog up my glasses, right? That's hot air. Or I can move the air to here, which is cold air. Imagine if i am uh, got a spoonful of hot soup. I'm gonna cool the soup so I don't burn my lip, right? That's cold air. So I, I can use that air to center, to find more center in the sound or more of the donut <laughs> in the sound. So I'll demonstrate. This would be cold air. And this is what I consider probably 70% of the time we should be blowing with that feeling of cold air, right to the lips. You hear it ringing in the room, maybe. This is a lively room. But if I take that same energy and now try to 
open up the diameter of that airstream so it covers the entire target, I'm not going to hear so much ring. You see, it sounds softer when it's dull because it doesn't have the ring in the sound. So I think it's really important if you're working on your intonation to find the center of every note where you get the clear thing. And then you take the center of this do and you go ray, find the center of ray. And then you can compare, is this a good major second? If not, I got to move my slides and that will move the center so that it's an in tune. It makes a good interval, right? So that's a little talk about uh, our intonation is, is if you're not really centering the note, you will have trouble finding, um, you know, good intervals, right? But if you center each individual note, one note, intonation's about comparing two notes. So you have to center both notes first and then measure the distance. And another trick nowadays too is most, most tuners uh, will come with a drone uh, where you can play the sound. So um, I'm picking, okay. picking fine. Take it up and off. Okay, so I can put that on and then play. Just play, play against the drone and see if your fourths, your fifths, your thirds are in tune with each other. Um, that's also a helpful thing. Um, Eric, so yeah, there was a question in the chat. Um, it'll be backing up just a little bit. Um, they were talking about uh, uh, how important of a role does psychology play in the uh, act of playing horn? And they're, uh, they're asking about a balance between psychology and technique. You touched on that a little bit, but I was wondering mm -hmm. if we directly contrast those two. Sure. Um, uh, so yeah, it's playing the horn. Uh, I mean, I'm playing any instrument, getting out on stage in front of a lot of people is, is a scary thing. And like I said, everybody gets nervous. Uh, I do, and, and everybody does. It's, it's um, and so the psychology, everybody has to figure out a way where the anxiety doesn't defeat your performance, you know? And so uh, I look at it this way, you know, it's it, the energy, because that's what happens. We get um, more energy when we get nervous. It's, it's, you know, goes back to when we were cavemen, right? You know, and it's survival, right? Uh, a tiger comes to attack you, your body produces adrenaline, you get a lot more energy because either you're gonna stay and fight that lion or you're gonna run. <laughs> and that's what the, why your body produces all that extra energy. So that we get into a scary situation like performing and we get that extra energy. That extra energy, if you don't control it, will always go to the wrong place, right? So, if you take that extra energy though and can sort of focus it into a, a more heightened uh, awareness you're you know to that you're not freaking out but you're actually listening more intently and more on your awareness then you can use that energy in a very positive way to help you um that's what as being in the zone is, I talked about that, but that's where athletes and musicians, I think you can actually play better than you've ever played before. If you can unlock that kind of focused mindset. So um, yeah, any kind of form of meditation, anything that helps you, you develop mental discipline will help you in on stage. Okay. Because um, you know, um, like I said, I, I think that uh, when you get this rush of energy and you get nervous, your brain it can be 
like the dog off the leash who just runs everywhere, <laughs> everywhere you don't want the dog to go, which, you know, psychologically for us is usually panic. It's like, oh my God, I'm going to miss the high note or what happens if I, you know, miss the solo or forget, have a memory slip or something. Those are, that's where your mind goes like the dog off the leash. Um, if you've got mental discipline, though, that's the dog on the leash, and you take this excited dog, but you still get him to go with you where you want him to go. And I think that's, you know, uh, so that requires, uh, and they can practice this uh, very easy exercise is to just put a timer on for five minutes and count your breath one, two, three, four, go back to one. Most people, the first time they try it, when the first minute, lose count. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, less than a minute. But if you can just clear your mind of everything else, let all the, we, our mind functions on so many levels, right? You know, right now you're listening to me, but you're drinking coffee, the sounds around you, of uh, people, uh, conversations, and your, your brain's taking that all in. But, you know, if you're focused, you're here, and you're blocking that other stuff out. And I think it's the same thing when we get nervous. It's like, all those voices in our head that are telling us what to be scared of and distracting us from doing this job here. So um, practicing um, little meditative exercises. Um, the breath counting idea, I read that in a, in a book once and the, and the author was saying that when you're trying to, to do this exercise, he said, you know, imagine that you're sitting on a hill looking over a river below you. And your job is to just sit there and count the breaths. Now, while you're sitting down looking uh, down at the river, a boat may come on, down into your view on the river. Don't get on the boat and float downstream. <laughs> it's like, it's just let it pass through your view. Because what happens when you're trying to practice uh, any kind of meditation? Something that's worrying you. Uh, or something maybe that, you know, made you happy, but you, you, you have blocked that out for the minute, for this moment, where all you're doing is counting your breath. And if you can stay on track with that for a full five minutes, you you it's like a muscle, you know, maybe first day, one minute. <laughs> uh, but after a month, you can work up to five minutes where you can block out all these thoughts, like the boat coming into view. You can block them out and just focus on the task of counting your breaths, and living in you know in this moment of of only thing is you're you're counting the breath as it comes through your nose and out and that's it, and that's that's the kind of presence of mind that you need on stage. And I hope that helps uh, answers that person's question. Yes, I think so. Great. Did you want to go to Gregory's video? Oh yeah, please yeah. We touched on that briefly, but um, there we go. Hello, Eric. My name is Grigori. I have a question. About double tongue in Mozart concerts. The first concert. Variation. No, variations from mm -hmm. from B. Yes, I play. Yeah, play. Another variant. Ah, 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 ah,
Jak, uh, jak Winpit skaże crash? How to play it better? Jak? Bye. Great question. And and um, uh, yeah, we talked a little bit about articulation. And, and I would say, first of all, bravo. I mean, it's really nice to hear somebody play some Mozart. Um, I would say, first of all, when it comes to our articulation on, on uh, whenever possible, I like the single tongue because usually it ends up sounding better. Um, double tongue on the horn is a little trickier. It's not as short an instrument as a trumpet. Um, so it's it's hard to get that quick response that a trumpet does, but um, I, I also have some thoughts about double tonguing that will help you. But let's start with the single tongue. Remember the diagram uh, I you know that had the the tooth here, and you have that flat shelf of of gum, soft tissue there, and the tongue sits in here. Well, if if the tongue it, the tongue is touching this this part of my mouth, the air can't get through. And then we just drop here and now the air can get through that, right? That, that, that little space. So it's a very small movement. Remember that the shorter the movement, the faster we can go. If your tongue is going boom, 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 it's gonna be slow. But if your tongue can go and just bounce right in here, release very quick then you're going to have a faster single tongue. So if I keep the air forward, that's the other thing. If your air is back here, it takes, you know, time for the air to travel maybe, you know, 10, 12 centimeters from the back of your mouth or back of your throat into the horn. And that's time, right? So keep the air here, but it's ready to go right to the, into the horn, right into the mouthpiece. And so start with the single note remember we said breathe said t and then i'm going to go like um one two one two one two one two like a piston at the tip keeping the air focused here and just um like my hands slapping through well I'll think about the water again if i put the water on the sink and maybe you go like this when you were a kid in the bathtub splashing through this column of water, slicing it. That's what I'm gonna do with my air. And this, this, this short movement, this short distance that my tongue is, is, is just bouncing right there at the teeth, the faster I can single tongue. So I would start with trying to work up the speed on your single tongue by keeping the air forward and just keeping the movement of the tongue as small a distance as possible, okay? That's double tongue. Um, you know, most players, at least I encountered, were taught double tongue as saying, taka, taka, taka. And if we all say that out loud, taka, taka, that ka is way back here. And the distance, again, we're trying to shorten the distance. So taka taka works on trumpet because it's so short, I think probably better. On the horn, not so much. So let's change taka to daga, ga, ga is not as far back as ka. So daga, 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 daga. So everyone say out loud, taka, 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 taka. And now feel how shorter it is when we say, now, if you feel the air, ka, ka, ka is very weak. The air isn't very strong. So when you double tongue that way, every other note sounds kind of weak. It doesn't sound balanced. You have a strong note and you have a weak note. But if you say, that's the, the, the ga is uh, more even. It's not, you don't have this great strong and weak, but you have two notes that sound a little bit more even. And even, even better than that and shorter, let's all say diggy, 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 diggy,
the 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 backstroke is is not as far back. Instead of compare that now to the original one. That seems like a very big distance that your tongue is traveling. But all seems very much close to the front of your mouth. So again, distance is time, greater time to travel the greater distance. Shorten the distance and you can move faster. And so that is better for me than it's slower and it's it's it doesn't sound good to me so um uh, if you're double tonguing this then then uh, i i would smooth it out too um i always feel that you know when you want to sound like a virtuoso um in 16th notes it has to sound easy it can't i know we sometimes we we're trying to get clarity and in the Mozart concerti, some editions have staccatos on all the 16th notes. Um, and if you, you can play it staccato, but it sounds sometimes a little too heavy and like you're working hard. So, sorry. It sounds a little heavy. I like to think smoother. Because the faster I go, and think about this, as faster anybody goes, the short and long really matter when you're traveling fast. If, it's, if you're playing really fast and you're playing very short, there's no tone. You can't really hear the pitches so well, right? But um, if I play actually longer than the pitch registers, the, the faster I go, the pitch registers, if I keep the notes actually a little fuller. So. Sorry, it's not on my fingers yet, but, but yeah, da, 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 instead of. It, that heavier tongue, yes, it's more pointed, but it, to me, it doesn't sound as like uh, carefree, like you want to hear from a virtuoso, right? So. You know, just let it roll off your tongue. Da -da 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 -dum -dum -da 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 -da. That's single tonguing, of course, too. Uh, if you want it faster and you need to shift into the double tongue, like I said, digi 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 is, uh, again, probably not as pointed but you'll think you'll find it to be more balanced and more fluid. Um, I think the thing about double tonguing too is to keep the air here. It, it, people forget to blow through a series of notes. Uh, they get so caught up in the movement of their tongue that they don't re remember to keep the air forward enough. So I hope that helps you, Gregory. It's much like lip trills too. People get caught up in the movement here at the lips and they forget to blow. So you get people sort of get stuck on the lip trail and they go, and you hear it's kind of thin sound and there's not fluid. But if I keep the air moving, you know, you keep drilling the air, then the movement of the lips has it actually to, you know, the, the desired effect of keeping the trill going. So again, I say I come back to airflow. <laughs> it's, it's a common, common theme, um, but it's the biggest, I, I swear it's the biggest problem I think most horn players tend to have. And it's um, going back to my original statement at the beginning of this class is just all of these little um, challenges we have, lip trills or double tonguing or uh, uh, intervals uh, that are tricky or hard. our mind off the job of just blowing straight into the horn. Any other questions? I think Claude has a question for you. Hey, Eric. Hey, how you so, doing? Uh, the, going back a little bit to the uh, subdivision of the phrase, uh, Dale Williams did a uh, master class years ago 
was it five years ago that she said something like that it really stuck with me and ever since then I, I feel like i've gotten into maybe i'm theorizing about phrasing now and how it applies to everything in my life it seems like everything either goes to something or it comes away from something and so i find myself it's not written in music i guess it's like an implied phrasing i'm always oh, yeah. shinnuing or deeper shinnuing and i don't think i ever plateau on anything but I, I, I asked, it's a, I'm curious, do you find if there's ever any music that you would play just plateau consistently? Like maybe it's explicitly written like that? I, you know, I think that I'm, sh you know, I, I, it's rare for me that I think of places where a composer is writing something intentionally to be static, but there are places, you know, uh, if I played Contrabassoon, the first note of, also Sprock Zarathustra <laughs> um, I, I, or, you know, not to be uh, f funny, uh, but I, I do think they're probably, I think of Shostakovich as there are places where it's, it's icy cold and, and there's the tension is, is that you feel something's going to happen, but there's a moment mayor where maybe where the music feels static and it's not moving yet. Um, but I think those moments are rare in music. And I, I come back to the idea that the composers write the notes on the page. They don't necessarily give us every little shading. You know, it's left to the performer, you know, to humanize their notes. I mean, obviously the composers have this, like I said, almost a divine connection to writing music and, um, and, you know, I'm sure in their head as they're writing it, they have, it's coming to life, but it's our jobs as musicians to bring it to life. And and not every, they're not, you know, some composers are much more detailed than others, you know, Mahler, Debussy, you know, um, where every note seems to have, um, uh, you know, an articulation, a dynamic and, 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 a, and a, a, a crescendo diminuendo or something. Um, but, um, some, the majority of the music that that I see, you know, doesn't. Um, great composers, even. Well, you know, Strauss, Heldenleben. You know, and I think it's got one crescendo in that whole long, grand moment. And it's not interesting if every note is equal. I think there's an implied uh phrasing in meter right downbeats are heavier and two three four usually push ahead so da da dum di da da ya dum di da dum bum di you know and so on you, this so um it's not always going to be spoon fed by the composer in 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 in, in every moment showing where it should go i think we have to feel that and the way i feel it may be the, different than the way you feel it which is what makes it interesting in in hearing you know both of us you know uh and 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 uh why own more than one recording of a piece or go hear a con a piece that you've already heard before because every time it's going to be a little different because everyone has little different feelings about it um and bring something different to to those performances but but I think you know it's it's it that subdivision level of of really crafting at least your version of it, and finding the phrase within. And you notice when when I sang that passage from Heldenleben, you know it sounds lyrical, but a lot of horn players just kill every note as loud as possible, and it it that doesn't sound like music to me. You know it's a, um, it should be sound like loud singing. And that means some notes are louder than others, and that there's a destination in the phrase of di da dum bum be da da dum di da dum be da 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 da, you know, and so on. So, um, you know, I think it was Julia talked about the importance of singing in her question, and it's 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 equally important for intonation as it is. It's just finding the life of a phrase and the way in which you hear it and to find this, which is not written in to every, every moment in music.
uh, Volodymyr, could you please uh, <laughs> translate to Ukrainian and ask if anyone has any more questions? Okay. Uh, так, по-перше. Um, чи у когось ще є питання, і то можете їх задавати зараз. І друге, то якби перекат. Що з ним зараз чи потім? Бо якби можна перекласти і зараз. Okay, I hope I haven't bored everybody to death. I got one last thing I didn't, I forgot to mention. Uh, it was a question about um, high register and it, and it's I, um, seeing Claude there is something I've talked to Claude's um, dad about and he just thinks it's gold. So I, he'll be mad at me if I don't, if I don't mention it. But if you take, this is about high register. And if you take take your mouthpiece and just buzz from like a high note to a low note and back, glissando. I think most people will find that the angle of the air changes, all right? And so when I start high, I'm blowing more down at the mouthpiece. And then as I gliss down, I'm blowing more straight down the mouthpiece. And then as I bend it back up, the air comes back, you know, across the floor of the mouthpiece at the bottom here. And, and the focal point comes right to the rim again. So... Now we're all built slightly differently, so I, I don't I don't pretend to say that this is going to be perfect solution for everybody's high register, but I do think if you can keep that fast air and point it more straight down on the high notes, you know, and you'll find uh, the high register the high notes pop out more easily. Hey Eric, yeah. yes, could you do that buzz? Uh, I'm not sure where the microphone is on your device, but maybe oh, okay. away from it. Yeah, I'll stand for the back. So again, from a high note to a low note, um, the, the air I'm blowing more down. And then as I go lower, I'm blowing more straight into the mouthpiece. And as I glissando back, I'm bending the air more and more downstream, closer and closer to the rim. So and then if I want to just come in on a high note, I really am just spiking the air straight down. So, you know, um, if you're successful with that feeling on the mouthpiece, hey, you know. Eric, yeah. So it, it's still an automatic compression on your microphone. Can you do it three times in a row and we can, uh, the microphone will figure it out? Okay. So here's three short high notes. I'm just blowing straight down. Right. And so better, you got that? No, it's Eric. It's it, so when the when the phone hears something loud, the compressor just shuts everything down for a second, and okay. then after like two or three seconds, it'll open up once it gets used to the new volume. I see. If you do the high note thing. You probably have to do it like six times. We might hear the sixth one. Okay. <laughs> All right. And maybe should I sustain it? Or yeah. you know, or play something on your horn first, then do the buzz. Okay. The horn is louder than the buzz. Right? You hear that? We're not getting there. We'll have to figure that one out. <laughs> okay. Well, it's it's basically very strong burst of air pointed straight down at the rim. And so and that's just uh, you hear that as part of that anyway, right? <laughs> just the first little bit. It's not your fault. You we can, very, we can hear the very beginning of the note and then the compressor is like, oh. Oh, <laughs> we know you're nailing it. Like, <laughs> that's like a high C sharp, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. But yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, you, the concept is there and I'll have to just trust people to do it. I'll do it softly on the mouthpiece. Just, you know, the. And that feeling of bending it, bending the air straight down or close to the rim when you're up high. I think that's the most important concept to, to get. And then, you know, for people who have, you know, 
had questions about coming in on high notes. I did softly. I hope you can hear that. <laughs> but I, again, I'm just bending it straight down. And you can almost feel that if you if you could mark points from the edge of the mouthpiece and draw a line on the floor of the mouthpiece inside, that every note has a target point, you know? And so, yeah, I mean, I'll, again, I'll try it softly, um, but if, if I just aim to the right point, and so I'm just keeping my air fixed at that point, very close to the rim. And it just makes, it's, it's not at that point, it's not about, that was a high C, it doesn't hurt. If I just keep the air strong, fast, and focused at the rim. Make sense? Yes, thank you so much. <laughs> All right. Um, well, I, I know we've lost some people. It's getting late there, I'm, I'm sure, in Kiev. And, and uh, I'm sorry for, you know, it's hard to... It's, a, it's not a masterclass, obviously, where you can get people to play and you can coach them. I, I, I gathered that. Um, so sorry for it being so luxury. Um, and it's the coffee talking this morning. I had make, makes me chatty. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Eric, for doing this. Um, uh, is there anyone else, maybe Vladimir, can you ask if there's anyone else that has something final before we close this out? Um, thank wow. you so much for doing this, Eric. Ah, my really pleasure. Uh, my heart goes out to the Ukrainian people, of course. And um, um, yeah, I mean, it was uh, my grandmother on my father's side uh, always said she was from Russia. and 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 yet... I do remember her saying, well, where were you born? She said, Kiev. And of course, at that time, and when she was born in 1902, I guess it was part of Russia. And, and so, you know, it's like the light bulb goes off, you know, when the war started of like, wait a minute, I'm part Ukrainian, you know, 25%. <laughs> um, and uh, my grandfather um, was from Poland, uh, her husband, but he, he's very much from the South. And he always said, that in those days, early 1900s, month to month, it was part of Russia or po uh, sometimes Poland. And um, so I think by Russia, because it was near the Ukrainian border, maybe he was <laughs> where he lived was partly Ukraine uh, through some of his early childhood. The most of my grandparents emigrated in 1910, roughly, you know, but uh, it's my own personal connection, but I, I it's just, this whole thing is so terribly devastating in terms of just what's going on. I don't know what, to, cannot make any sense of this, but happy to talk about music and hope it provided some relief and uh, inspiration for our musical friends here. So thank you guys for making this happen. Uh, thank you for translating uh and uh for everyone who hung in there through most of this and and you guys in the air force there for what you do and uh for mike for making this happen and you know uh if we can do do more in the future like i said i'm happy to do more but i'm i know i've got colleagues at the met who would be happy to um you know take part in in um more at, or reaching out to to you guys there and um um the Met as an organization, I'm proud to say, has been very, um, very much supportive of Ukraine and uh, and and uh, the Ukrainian people. And um, we've done two two benefit concerts for Ukraine from the, the first month the war started, and then with the on the anniversary back in February. Um, and we've been hiring Ukrainian singers um, and canceling on a lot of Russian artists. And so, um, um, may this whole thing be over as soon as possible. That's a good way, I guess, to sign off. So thanks so much again, Eric.
Sure. Thank you again. It's nice to see you guys in person sometime. Uh, all of you, including the people in Ukraine. All right. Be well. Thanks again. Same.